So let me introduce quickly Dr. Heidelbot. So basically, uh, I met Heidelbot some uh, years ago. We were uh, students together at, uh, uh, when we were at the University of Cambridge. He, he always was a very bright student, I have to say. And um, he did his um, PhD in the area of nanophotonics. I have to say that my first paper was with uh, Heidelbot, so I feel very, very pleased that he is uh, joining us today. Um, later, uh, Heidelbot was at the University of, of Birmingham, and in 2019, he moved to the University of Khalifa in the United Emirates. Um, Dr. Haider has built an international reputation in the areas of uh, nanophotonics and, uh, and some holographic methods to, to build uh, optical devices. So he's very um, recognized in this area. He has like more than 100 uh, papers and he has been a pioneer on many of these uh, areas so I am uh, I am very happy that we are going to have a, um, a, a talk and a speech about a very new uh, and fancy area in the in, in, in 3d printing which is which is um, which is a growing area so i am i am very happy that we are going to uh, have a, a talk about this topic so uh, without further um uh, hi there please uh, i will be very happy if you can uh, share your screen i will uh, stop uh, sharing my my screen and and you can uh, sure. start the presentation sure thank you Uh, Jervin, can you see the screen? Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I can, okay, I can, perfect. I can see. Oh. perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jervin, for the invite. And it is a great, great honor to be over here with you again. As you said, uh, we have a lot of experiences and memories together, a lot of papers together as well, and a lot of uh, uh, times we've spent together as students at Cambridge and uh, later on as well. So thank you so much for the invite. Uh, and for the kind of introduction. Uh, so yes, I will be giving an overview of uh, what our research uh, team has been actively doing uh, in the last uh, four or five years. And uh, I will basically be giving you a background on uh, our work on contact lenses uh, mostly, uh, and uh, then how this uh, work is now leading to uh, 3D printing. So 3D printing uh, contact lenses, is, it seems more of uh, a necessity now. Uh, because of uh, our engagement with industry uh, and to just improve the uh, technology that is readiness level of our uh, devices. So uh, we will start with a bit of background uh, in the nanophotonics and contact lenses and then we'll lead at the end towards uh, 3D printing. So uh, yes, as uh, Yunwen, you mentioned, I'm uh, currently uh, I'm in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, there's a national university, uh, Khalifa University. It's the uh, number one ranked university in Middle East uh, and, and UAE as well. Uh, my my office is uh, uh, over here and uh, my lab labs are in this campus and some labs are uh, in this campus. Uh, the core laboratories of nanophotonic facilities, they are, uh, this, this campus is uh, sort of in the outskirts of, of uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, the weather over here is very hot, uh, today it's 50. Uh, over here we have, uh, I have a small uh, research team that is uh, growing. Over here I will mostly showing my postgraduate and postdoctoral uh, research fellows. This is Dr. Mohammed. He was my PhD student in University of Birmingham and then after doing his PhD he joined me uh, as a postdoc uh, at uh, uh, Khalifa Un University and this is Dr. Fahad. So two postdocs, uh, two PhDs and one research assistant and I, I also have uh, research visitors who visit me uh, every summer 
uh, or so and uh, help us uh, accelerate the research that they are doing. So you'll be seeing these names quite often in the coming slides. Uh, okay, so just to introduce you to the journal uh, theme. So as you know, since uh, the last decade, uh, this uh, field has been actively, you know, it has seen a lot of research uh, funding from research councils, industry, uh, a lot of interest in this area. Uh, also, uh, uh, lots of start startups uh, came in this area. Uh, a lot of previous, uh, previously, uh, like uh, mature companies like uh, Google, Microsoft, even uh, moved into these technologies, and they were made a lot of wearable technologies as well. Uh, as you know, uh, they have made a lot of uh, smart uh, wearables. Uh, may those be smart watches, uh, uh, smart. Uh, clothing, smart eyewear, uh, and especially from healthcare point of view, this has been uh, of uh, great interest. Uh, when I was in uh, United Kingdom, uh, the research councils were focusing on this bit, this aspect of wearable technologies heavily, that uh, we should be producing wearable technologies which are able to monitor an individual's health and then give the data, uh, give a feedback about that uh, to the healthcare providers regularly. So this regular feedback basically improves the amount of data you have uh, regarding a patient. And as you know, in uh, United Kingdom, it's uh, a lot of people are aged. So they are alone at home and uh, uh, every time they need to visit the hospital, it's a very inconvenient and exp expensive task for the taxpayer. So. Uh, an automated system like this, where wearable technologies at home are monitoring the elderly and providing the healthcare provider the data about them, uh, that will like avoid accidents, avoid complications as well. So the, a lot of interest went into healthcare technologies and uh, wearables as well. So we we uh, we mostly focus, being from photonics area, we mostly focus in this area in vision. Uh, so we started from nanophotonic sensors and then later on we went towards uh, vision enhancement as well of some sort. So today uh, I will be highlighting uh, mostly uh, everything to do with contact lenses uh, that we do. Uh, so initially uh, we started from uh, our interest and aim was always to have some sort of nanostructures on contact lenses. Uh, we inspired that, uh, inspired to do that for a long time because uh, I had done nanostructures on a glass slide or a silicon uh, silicon substrate, but never on a contact lens. So this was a, a very big uh, like ambition of ours. Uh, how we did that, I will show you. Uh, then you know our group also specializes in making a lot of sensors, making sensors for glucose, for pH, for alcohol. So uh, we were inspired or motivated by Google's interest in making a contact lens that measures glucose in tears uh, for diabetic patients. So we, we did a bit of work on this as well. And then finally, uh, vision improvement uh, for the colorblind uh, patients. So everything uh, more or less to do with uh, photonics. Uh, and finally also, I will mention uh, how we are integrating all of this in 3D printing. Okay, so uh, just to introduce you to the topic, like uh, what we have is uh, on the uh, on the left side you have a butterfly, butterfly, very famous uh, butterfly. Again, I think this comes from uh, South Africa and uh, South South America. And uh, this morpho butterfly is very famous for its blue color. And this blue color is uh, unique because it is a structural color. It's uh, the reason for its being is uh, a Christmas tree-like structure, uh, which is available in the scales of this butterfly. A white light comes, interacts with this structure, and blue light is reflected. Uh, other light is either transmitted or absorbed. So uh, nanoscale features interact very uh, aggressively or very positively with nanostructures. Nanostructures can be uh, in the dimensions of 100 of nanometers. And as a result of this interaction, you can make optical devices, uh, filtering devices, or you know, uh, those sort of interesting devices. And this is the theme of our work as well. Uh, we create uh, nanostructures, which are not in uh, tens of nanometers; they are in hundreds of nanometer scale. Uh, and then you know, we make our uh, light interact with it to create different filtering or other uh, effects. Uh, 
we make nanostructures using light as well. So we make things for light, with light. Uh, that is uh, something that we do. So this is uh, the laser that we most optimally use. We have a number of lasers with different wavelengths now. But most of our devices are made with this laser. It's a pulse laser, uh, green. Uh, we have the infrared version of this as well. But uh, uh, green being uh, right in the middle of the visible band. So it works for most materials uh, that we work with. Uh, so the green laser, when it reflects from a mirror, uh, it interferes, creating an interference pattern. This is a series of fringes. And uh, a very simple example, once we uh, put a sample over here in this interference region, uh, the laser interacts with the sample. Now the sample in this case is glass slide and on glass slide there is a bit of uh, absorbing material which can be a dye or ink. In this case, it's this is ink from a marker. Uh, and what happens is that after interacting with the laser beam, uh, you see this uh, nanoscale grating formed on the glass slide. We have this transparent substrate that does not interact with this laser. The laser is not focused. If it was focused, it will basically rough on the surface, but this is not focused. It passes through the transparent glass slide, but this absorbing material, it interacts with it. And wherever the intensity is high, the material gets ablated, removed from the surface. And as a result, you have a nanoscale grating. Uh, a very practical example of this, these are uh, signatures on a glass slide. Uh, from our colleague named uh, Fernando, if I remember correctly. Uh, as you can see, uh, Dr. Dr. Yunwen is also one of the authors. This was uh, very early paper, papers of ours uh, in this field. Uh, so yeah, you can produce these nanostructures on a surface, uh, on a hard surface, transparent surface, very quickly. Uh, and later on, I continued this work in uh, Birmingham. I moved to Birmingham and in our lab, we recreated this setup. And uh, we were able to, you know, produce very large scale uh, gratings. Uh, as you can see, this is a single grating produced uh, on a glass slide. And it is uh, at, the, at, at a single uh, angle, you can see all the light being diffracted. So it's a single grating uh, or all of them are more or less uniform. So that is how we produce nanostructures. A uh, bit of simulation that, uh, what, what about the dimensions of these nanos, uh, the, the, the gratings that we produce? Uh, this is uh, a simple s a simulation that simulates uh, incident beam coming from the top and then reflected from the bottom. Uh, you have a standing wave. And if you put, our, uh, put your glass slide at uh, different angles in the standing wave, uh, these are the graphs. So what you see is at uh, different angles, uh, for example, at 30 degree, you have the pink graph and at 15 degree, you have another graph. You can change the periodicity uh, of the, the grating that is produced uh, just by changing the uh, tilt angle. And here is the demonstration of that. So using the setup, same setup and using the same material, which is ink that absorbs green color, you can produce uh, structures from uh, several microns to uh, sub-micron uh, structures as well. So you can make these uh, one-dimensional gratings in by changing the tilt angle. Uh, apart from the tilt angle, there are some other parameters, for example, the number of exposures you do. So we can also make two-dimensional structures. These are not the best uh, images we got for these, but these are like uh, square-shaped periodic structures. The diffraction pattern that comes from them uh, shows the true image. These are some rhombus uh, type structures. And as you can see, uh, we have done uh, multiple exposures. Uh, for this exposure, uh, we rotated the sample by 90 degrees. Over here, we rotated by 60 degrees. And over here, we rotated by 30 degrees. It changes the shape of the diffraction pattern these gratings produce. Uh, this is just to show you the uh, flexibility that, you know, with this sample, with this sort of setup, you can make a very uh, high aspect ratio uh, samples as well. So in one direction, there is sub, sub micron periodicity and in the other direction, you have micron scale periodicity. If you're using photolithography or you know, you're using electron beam, this is uh, this turns to be a slow process for samples like these. So in uh, one direction, uh, very small periodicity and in the other direction, very large periodicity.
you can see the N, uh, anisotropic asymmetric diffraction pattern over here. Uh, apart from, uh, you know, uh, just making gratings, uh, we have also been experimenting with different types of uh, mirrors or in other words, we have been changing the uh, interference patterns. So rather than having a flat mirror, if you use a concave mirror, what, what that does is rather than making periodic gratings, uh, now you can get uh, these periodic rings which are imprinted into your, uh, on top of your sample. So this uh, layer, uh, in this case, we use a thin film of gold. Uh, it gets uh, uh, like imprinted in the form of these concentric rings, uh, which actually acts as a, a Fresnel lens. The Fresnel lens also has a very similar structure. So this structure actually, which was a, a mirror image uh, of, a, uh, of a lens, uh, it acts as a lens as well. Uh, and this is, uh, this was more of our recent work. Uh, over here, we replaced the mirror with a, with a corner cube. So we had three beams interacting at the same time. And uh, the very interesting structure was produced. Uh, what, we, what I want to show over here is that there is a grating. And within the grating, there is another grating. So this is a, like a superimposed hierarchical structures, which you can produce with uh, this uh, setup as well. Okay, this was another work we, which I conducted in, uh, uh, in Cambridge uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Yerman. And uh, what we did over here was, rather than uh, having a mirror, you can replace the mirror with uh, an, uh, a thing that is non-uniform, a reflective surface. And the light interference beams are uh, dictated by this topography. And it gets printed into this, into this uh, layer. As you can see, the image of this surface gets imprinted into this surface. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we wanted to sh try not only different shapes, but we also wanted to try different uh, colors. So this work of ours showed that uh, as long as the laser is absorbed by the material that we are using, so we can use a variety of materials. So we use a different combination of dyes uh, with uh, different transmission optical properties. Uh, and we were able to produce nanostructures uh, out of them. So as you can see, this this uh, this, this uh, way of producing nanostructures, uh, unlike photolithography or electron beam, where they are very specific in terms of materials you have to use, it's uh, quite independent, uh, quite flexible. Yeah. Uh, also, these gratings are very interesting because they are made out of a material that it's on, that on its own absorbs some wavelengths and allows other wavelengths to transmit. So when we check the diffraction, uh, which was coming from these gratings. So these gratings would uh, absorb the wavelength they like to absorb, and then uh, the other wavelengths were diffracted. These were like uh, wavelength selective diffraction, what these uh, gratings were uh, uh, exhibiting, compared to the black grating that diffracts almost all the colors. Okay, so now moving ahead, uh, we wanted to actually now change the substrates as well. So, because we knew that our setup can make nanostructures from uh, any dark material, uh, it can uh, also make this structure on any material. So this is something we wanted to try that can we make nanostructures with this setup on any given transparent material. So, what you see over here is this is a glass slide on which we made a very thin film of uh, edible uh, material. So this internal material may, we made out of many things. We made out of uh, corn syrup. We made it out of uh, sugar solutions as well. We made it out of rice paper as well. And on top of this, we put a dot of uh, an absorbing dye. And then we were able to produce nanostructures on edible materials as well. A uh, one-dimensional, two-dimensional nanostructures we were able to produce. This work was carried out uh, a while back, uh, It took, uh, but it was published uh, quite recently. It was uh, very uh, famous in, uh, in news media because it was like just uh, a step getting closer to uh, edible holograms. Uh, and finally, we come after looking at the background of our uh, nanostructures. Uh, as you can see, this is the same setup. In the past, we were using a glass slide and we were making our nanostructures on the glass slide. But what we started to do now uh, uh, was that we 
introduced a contact lens over here. Because at this point, we were seeing in literature, there was a lot of uh, interest in incorporating photonic crystals or gratings or those sort of structures on contact lenses. Now, most of the literature that was there, uh, people were making contact lenses in the lab, but they were mostly discs. They were made, made out of very hard materials and they were very thick. Uh, they were publishing them as contact lenses, but they were not contact lenses. So yes, using the same setup that we have, we actually produce cont uh, nanostructures on commercial contact lenses. So this contact lens over here is from Johnson & Johnson. You can get this for, fifth, for around 50p in England. Uh, this is a daily disposable one, which means it's uh, the most fragile one that you can buy. So it's, it's supposed to last you one day. Okay? So it's a very fragile surface, uh, which we attach to a glass slide. Uh, we let it dry. When, it dry. when it's dry, it sticks very well. So it's mostly a hydrogel. It sticks very well. Then we incorporated a dye on top of it, a small dot, uh, repeated the process. Uh, the process was a bit tricky because our dye uh, it got absorbed into the hydrogel. So we had to be careful uh, how thick our layer should be. And also, this was not a hard surface now. So the removal process was difficult. Like uh, the material was uh, not getting removed very easily. So a lot of optimization over here had to be done. Uh, when we were optimizing this, and as you can see, we use a different laser this time. When we were optimizing this, the structural damage was also done to the laser, so uh, to the lens. So it would melt very easily. So, so yeah, a lot, lot of optimization and parameters went over here. But as you can see, after uh, after that process, uh, not only did we do 1D nanostructures, we also did 2D nanostructures on the surface of contact lens. After this, uh, even few companies who have been trying this for a while, but they were not using the laser approach. They were using nano imprinting or that sort of approach contacted us and they were asking for the parameters and the actual laser that we are using. And uh, some companies actually already had patents on this, that one day we'll be able to do this and then we'll make so and so device. But they were of course not using the laser approach. And uh, the challenge this thing solved was that, you know, you, you had added we had added uh, information uh, or nanostructure or a nanophotonic sensor uh, on top of a very fragile, flexible, and uh, variable device. So this was already a biocompatible, bio FDA-approved device on top of which you have added the nanostructures, which can be used for sensing, for decoration, and so and so. We'll, we'll, I'll be telling you a bit more applications of this. So it's essentially a surface of water. On top of it, you have added this, these nanostructure holograms. Okay, so uh, taking this work ahead, what we are currently active in is that uh, there is a eye condition called glaucoma, mostly over elderly people above the age of 50 get this, where the eye pressure inside the eyes increases. Uh, in some patients, not all, uh, the curvature of the eye changes due to the pressure. Okay, so there is a lot of interest in measuring the or monitoring the changes in the curvature of the cornea. And not only for glaucoma, for other eye infections as well. So uh, if you have a contact lens, a soft contact lens that has a nanostructured hologram on top of it, but these are just proof of concept uh, experiments. And you know, if the curvature changes and the hologram changes its color, then you know you can get uh, an idea about the the curvature, if the curvature is increasing or decreasing. Uh, this is a visual ex a visual form of measuring it. Of course, you can just look into the mirror and see what the color is and uh, if the IOP is increasing or decreasing. And you can also actually do it uh, very accurately. Uh, before I uh, mention how we are going to, or how we are doing it, I will just mention the, the other companies who are who have proposed another contact lens. So this is an electrical solution completely by this company. They have also done trials on around 20 patients. So these are electrical coils. Uh, this is made out of PDMS. It has many many layers. This contact lens. Uh, during marketing, you will only find this actually, this picture. Uh, but you know you have to dig through that how the contact lens actually works. So you, for the contact lens to actually deliver and receive power, you have to wear another. A wireless transmitter and receiver nearby as well. 
So for an elderly who's going to be wearing this for 24 hours to measure the complete glaucoma cycle, it uh, can be a bit difficult. Uh, so as the curvature changes, the distance between the wire changes and then uh, that initiates a signal that is received and recorded. Uh, so as, as, as I said, this is not very oxygen permeable. It's quite hard and uh, not very comfortable as well. Uh, so an alternative, a visual sensor completely based on optics. Uh, how do you measure the exact color? You use a free smartphone application that can basically you can select any pixel and you can get RGB values and the app itself can tell you the approximate value of the IOP. So yeah, I mean, some sort of uh, sensing it can be performed by these uh, nanostructures. Uh, this is one, one aspect where the actual dimension of the contact lens is changing. Uh, we are also pursuing other directions where we are making these nanostructures from functionalized materials. Uh, so the, they change their color when they come into contact with certain ions or analytes in the tear solutions. You can use these holograms for other sort of, sort of sensing as well. Okay, uh, and also uh, like the goal is also to have uh, contact lenses which can have uh, each one of the hologram response to different things because you know our engagement with uh, uh, patients and industry uh, taught us that uh, in a, on a human eye one thing doesn't change uh, independently. So when the eye pressure is changing, other parameters are changing as well. So uh, uh, contact lenses or variable technologies which can measure more than one. Uh, uh, more than one analyte or more than one physical parameter at a time, they, they are definitely uh, better solutions. Uh, th this is also uh, another goal that we are uh, going towards. Uh, okay, so uh, I will I will skip this. Uh, so the second part of the talk, I said that we'll I'll introduce you briefly about the variable uh, glucose sensors. So we we have a history of uh, doing glucose sensing. Uh, glucose sensing we do with exact same materials uh, which are used for contact lenses, which is a hydrogel. So in a hydrogel, we you, we add this uh, element, uh, boronic acid, that makes the we bind it to the hydrogel, and this hydrogel then becomes responsive to. Glucose. In response to glucose, it expands and then contracts. Now we have this uh, in liquid form, uh, and then we can cure it in any form we want with uh, exposing it to UV light. Now we cure it uh, to form nanophotonic devices. So here it is an, exa ex an example for you. This is a random surface. Uh, we buy it commercially from a, a company called Thor Labs. It's a diffuser. This is a holographic engineered diffuser. When light passes through this, it makes a ring. Okay, so we we pour this solution on top of this commercial diffuser, then we shine UV light on it, so it solidifies, and then we peel it, peel it out. So when we peel it out, our hydrogel on one side it gets imprinted uh, with this shape. Okay, so our hydrogel is not like uh, uniform on both the sides. Uh, on one side it has this. Uh, diffusive uh, structure. So now what it does is our hydrogel uh, sensor is over here in the middle in the water. When a laser passes through it, it makes a ring as well because now our hydrogel is a diffuser. So we have made a diffuser out of a polymer, uh, but that polymer is uh, glucose sensitive. So now when the glucose in the solution changes, uh, the size of the ring changes. Okay. Now, size of the ring is uh, difficult to monitor. If you look at optical sort of like when you talk to industry, they want a very simple measurement and readout system. The size of the ring is uh, difficult to monitor, but uh, the intensity in the center is very easy to monitor. Okay, so, so rather than measuring the size of the ring, we focus on measuring the the zero order intensity, and and definitely it was changing with changing. Uh, glucose concentration. So we, we were able to produce this hydrogel based uh, glucose sensor. Uh, so we, 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 did, we have a lot of uh, work and literature on this where we have made uh, many uh, nanophotonic devices out of these hydrogels. Uh, and then you know when there was uh, 
activity in our group on contact lenses. So because uh, contact lenses and hydrogen uh, and our glucose sensors were made more or less with the same material. So this is a contact lens that is clear made out of uh, glucose, made out of hydrogen. And this is a contact lens that has a grating on it. So it's, it's basically uh, the previous diffuser stuck on top of it. It's very easy to attach, uh, attach it, you know, a bit uh, with extra step of curing. Okay, so we sort of made this contact lens which has this uh, diffusive grating, and this responds to the surface only. This patch responds to glucose concentrations. Uh, to 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 make this work uh, lightly more flashy, what we did was that we we repeated the experiments, which we can actually easily do with a. Uh, uh, a, a small uh, light intensity LED. We actually repeated this with the mobile phone as well. So light source, and this is a photo detector of a mobile phone. Now every mobile phone has a photo detector uh, next to the front camera. Okay, so we use that uh, with an app, a photo instant intensity app, and we then we uh, uh, we did this experiment. So uh, an eye model, contact lens, hydrogel. And different solutions. So, with changing glucose concentrations, uh, we were actually able to change, uh, measure a change in uh, uh, photo detector intensity as well. So, uh, so we, we we were active in this area uh, for a while, uh, and we have we have a lot of literature published in this uh, in this area. But uh, the key issue is uh, when we have when we have been talking to many clinicians is that uh, glucose change in the blood is the best form of glucose to monitor for diabetics. Uh, the glucose in the tears is like half an hour, half an hour old compared to the glucose in the blood. So for diabetic patients who are who, who, who require continuous glucose monitoring, uh, the glucose in the blood or near the blood under the skin is the uh, best glucose uh, value they need to know. So. Uh, since uh, this engagement and this feedback, uh, we are now uh, more focused on uh, fibers. So uh, you will see growing number of startups who are specializing in making uh, glucose sensing fibers. So this company makes fibers uh, which sense glucose in uh, a large size arteries over here in the skin, uh, in the neck. And this is mostly for patients in uh, ICUs or in comas. So it it, it monitors their glucose uh, while uh, they are in unconscious state. Uh, this is another fiber that is uh, connected to an insulin pump. Okay, so these fibers are not inside. Uh, this one is not inside the uh, vessels. It sits uh, near the vessel under the skin. Uh, the glucose concentration or glucose value it's con uh, collecting is more or less uh, matching with the uh, with the with the value of the glucose in the blood. So uh, we are, we have been making fibers uh, with the same hydrogels. So this is the same hydrogel. This time, rather than making uh, a diffuser or a contact lens with it, we pour this solution in a tube, mold, cure it, and then pull it out. These are just some experiments on the optical properties of these fibers. Uh, previously, we were making the whole fiber, whole fiber from the glucose functionalized hydrogel. Now that didn't turn out to be very useful because when the whole fiber is acting as a sensor, when you put it in a glucose solution, it takes a very long time to reach its uh, most expanded state. So the sensor response time is very bad. So we uh, actually improved this problem by functionalizing the tip this time. So this is our latest work. So this is a fiber, and we attached our hydrogel to the fiber. And this time, uh, the pattern we have on top of it is the same diffuser. Okay, so our hydrogel. On top, on the top surface, it's patterned to be uh, a random diffuser. So when light travels through the fiber, it hits this hydrogel. Some of it is transmitted out. Some of that it is reflected back. So the setup is more or less like this: light comes, 
uh, interacts with the glucose solution and then the reflected light is going back to the spectrometer and we are having very good results with this so we have a fiber uh, the transmission is not of interest to us but the reflection signal and we have a very complex uh, uh, system to measure it very efficiently because the reflective signal is not very powerful so with this we can remotely measure uh, glucose concentrations in the right ph in the right uh, uh, temperature and physiological uh, conditions as well okay so uh, in the end uh, the last part of the presentation uh, i will say that uh, because we were active in uh, these contact lens area uh, and we saw a gap in the market uh, this uh, gap in the market actually because we were in the right uh, position so we entered this field as well we're mostly into sensors nanophotonic sensor based smart contact lenses but then we went into vision improvement as well because there was like uh, no competitive technology available so as this uh, picture highlights this is the opening match of world cup 2018 saudi arabia versus russia uh, around 200 million people if they were watching this uh, match they would have seen it in this sort of color scheme uh, they can't uh, see the difference between the two teams uh, so these uh, color blind patient, patients or color vision deficient uh, patients uh, they can't differentiate majority of them can't differentiate green and red very well so this means you know when they are driving they can't distinguish between red and green light very well if they are chefs or they are electricians if they are in our army navy fire firearms uh, similarly if they are artists or graphic designers so a lot of the lot of uh, professionals actually are having trouble in pursuing their careers of choice uh, because of this uh, vision deficiency uh, so this vision deficiency actually happens uh, as you can see this is a normal vision a normal vision we have blue green red cones uh, blue green and red cones should get activated in response to the corresponding light only uh, this is a color vision deficient vision and as you can see there is a big overlap between green and red cones this means when this light comes uh, the same amount of activation is happening for green cones and almost the same light same amount of activation is happening for red cones as well so rather than having a distinct amount of activation for green and red you have much similar activation for green and red so which is why uh, they mix mix the colors which are green and red so they see them both of them in the same shade uh, the categories of color vision deficiency around five percent of all the males on the planet are uh, no, no, not uh, percentage i think i have not uh, the percentages these are percentages are for the types of uh, uh, different color vision deficiencies in terms of number one in every 12 male is color color blind uh, and so it's more dominant in males uh, yes so five percent of all the males globally are color blind that comes up to around 200 million people uh, around the planet uh, the most common color blindness is this one uh, due to normally that is this one that i explained already so it is trouble in distinguish between green and red now, when we were actually getting into this work, what we saw very often was that there were glassing coming in the market. These glasses were actually what they were doing. They were incorporating filters on the glass, glass, uh, which will filter out this overlapping area. This overlapping area is the major area where uh, the excitation of green and red cones is very similar to each other. So if you filter this light out, uh, then in this area and this area, either there is a dominance of green activation or there is a dominance of red activation. So this uh, seems to help a few people. Uh, these glasses are from Inchroma. They are available on eBay, on Amazon. You can go and have a look at the reviews. So a lot of people, they are very expensive. When they buy it, a lot of people return them. So they don't uh, work for all the people because every person is colorblind to a different level. So this filter needs to be optimized every time for every patient. Uh, it's very difficult when you have a product like this. Okay, so 
uh, as we were into contact lenses, so we, we actually approached the contact lens uh, sort of scenario. Uh, we saw that in the market there were less contact lenses available. So we, were, we went ahead with the same sort of approach. We found a dye that was safe, non-toxic, widely used in biochemistry and with cells and which absorbs the same sort of wavelengths, which Enchroma was using as filters. So this is an auto 565 dye, uh, very easily available in many uh, uh, chemical supplying uh, companies. So we uh, produce contact lenses with these dyes. Uh, our initial approach was we use a commercial contact lens and we doped it with this dye in different concentrations. And then we optimized the time for which you need to dip it into these concentrations. We also looked at once uh, the contact lens gets doped, does, it, does the dye leak? Uh, there was a bit of leakage, uh, but at the moment, at that time, we didn't have uh, a solution for it. Uh, the, for our contact lens, the dye distribution inside the contact lens was very uniform. Uh, we also conducted the cell studies on our contact lenses for toxicity and biocompatibility. And we also studied the, uh, a clinical study where the patients were looking through our contact lenses and there was a massive improvement uh, in their test scores of the patients. Uh, the tests that the patients did were compared with Enchroma. These are the commercial uh, and our scores were either the same or better than uh, what Enchroma glasses were uh, performing. Uh, this work was actually published and it had a lot of resonance in the international news media and also in our prestigious news media because uh, I don't know the work is quite simple but uh, I think people have not looked at this uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, we, we have had a lot of interaction with patients as well. Uh, patients have shared very difficult stories, uh, the children, uh, how they are uh, struggling in sports or in early education, uh, how people would like to see Cadbury in its uh, true color, uh, how professionals are having a difficulty in making clothing decisions uh, and choosing uh, choosing uh, colors in school or so. So yeah, we have been interacted by parents, we have been in, uh, we have been contacted by Navy personnel. Uh, I have been contacted by police personnel uh, who have been restricted to desk duty because the lasers the rifles are using or the lasers that the taser guns are using are red in color. So they not they may not be able to differentiate uh, the background and the laser itself. So same is with uh, getting driving licenses. In some countries, there are strict laws that colorblind uh, individuals cannot drive. Uh, so if you're wearing glasses, uh, you have to take the glasses off uh, because, you know, this is like an extra gadget that you're wearing uh, when you do your driving test. But if you're wearing, wearing contact lenses, that's fine. So you can wear contact lenses and then you can do your driving test. And similarly, going into police and army, in some countries, colorblind patients cannot go into uh, these careers as well. So yeah, I mean, there is a lot of uh, demand for these uh, uh, contact lenses, as it seems. And uh, our work ahead has been mostly in uh, getting rid of that leakage issue. So this is uh, a hydrogel. And uh, this was our dye that we were using. And after a lot of uh, interaction with the chemists, we actually came up with a process in which we chemically uh, cross-link them. So our uh, contact lenses that we produced uh, now, they are like, uh, they don't uh, have this leakage uh, issue. So as you can see over here, uh, these are now contact lenses. The transmission is not uh, decreasing. We have made contact lenses for different optical windows for different uh, CVD types. And we are also making contact lenses which are like overlapping. So they can also uh, provide uh, filtering for more than one band. Uh, the good thing about our uh, method is that we can actually customize the contact lenses. We can actually customize the transmission and absorption uh, for each patient's need, depending on their uh, deficiency type. Uh, we are also we have we have patents on this this method of making this contact lens, and we are also pursuing at the moment a startup that my university over here is incubating at the moment. So we have like three people in the startup at the moment. 
OK, so uh, going ahead uh, for color blindness, you know, uh, for color blindness, the contact lenses we are making, it's more to do with, just to do with the filtering. So very recently we have using we, we use gold nanoparticles as well. The so gold nanoparticles because of plasmonics, they absorb uh, almost the same type of colors as well. So we have used these gold nanoparticles uh, mixed with hydrogels and then we made contact lenses out of them and they also gave us the same sort of uh, pinkish tint uh, and we also uh, compared their optical properties with the dyed contact lens and uh, the ones which are available. Uh, why we are doing this is because you know uh, the dyes we are using are very expensive so the dyes we are using over here are quite expensive so at the moment we are looking for an alternative for these uh, dyes seriously. Okay, this work has also uh, received a lot of uh, acknowledgements in news media. Uh, finally, uh, we come towards uh, 3D printing because uh, as you can see, we are making a lot of contact lenses, uh, either as composites, uh, either uh, uh, with nanostructured surfaces or either uh, most importantly for color blind uh, applications. So when we talk to our patients or when we want to do clinical trials, everyone asks, what is the TR TRL level? Uh, of the contact lenses. Uh, so if you are making our contact lenses in the lab, uh, we are usually, usually using molds. We put our hydrogels in the molds and then we cure them and we take them out of the mold. A uh, very slow process and uh, we only make one contact lens at a time and every contact lens is, uh, it has a lot of errors, they are different. Uh, so what we have started recently is we have just uh, started uh, using these open source printers and these open source printers uh, we can we don't we don't rely on the printers uh, we don't rely on the materials that come with the printer so we are exactly using the same materials which are our hydrogels and uh, with some photopolymer which is uh, sensitive to uv uh, and in the hydrogels uh, we are able to basically add uh, nanomaterials or we are able to add the dyes uh, and we are able to produce uh, the contact lenses uh, repeatedly. Uh, one thing is just the geometry and then printing it, but it's uh, not as uh, straightforward as that. You can also see the contact lens have been printed vertically. There is a lot of trial and error that went into this. So now we have the complete recipe of making these contact lenses. Uh, after something is 3D printed, it's very hard. So this also means that we have tried a lot of materials. Uh, so mostly, uh, most of the resins that we used, uh, they were toxic. So we can't, they are not applicable for contact lenses. So we, and all other resins, once they are cured with UV or 3D printed, they become very hard. So uh, you can't call them contact lenses, whatever structure gets printed. So that's why, you know, we have uh, used our own materials and optimized their uh, recipes as well. Uh, apart from that, uh, when you print con something, uh, 3D print something, it's a layer by layer process. So I'll, I'll give you this uh, example of this uh, 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 the contact lens that was printed horizontally. So when you're printing something horizontally, you, you the 3D printer prints uh, layer by layer. So first layer, second layer. And as a result of this, you have this uh, staircase effect, uh, which you will see over here. So uh, we also like sort of uh, got over this. Uh, at a certain extent. So our, our surf surfaces are uh, sort of smoother now. Uh, so we this, these are our initial samples. So what, what we did was like we have optimized the, the curing process itself. So our printers allowed us to actually uh, play with the uh, uh, layering parameters. Now how, how fast each, each layer should be printed and how fast it should be uh, moved up. One of the thing was that we also added one extra step on post printing. So after printing our contact lenses, we uh, dipped them again one more time in the resin. Uh, and then we cured them. So then what happened was that these staircase, uh, these were actually filled with the uh, hydrogel. If the hydrogel is viscous enough, it sticks over here and then you can cure it again. So it uh, sort of gets rid of this uh, staircase effect and the surface becomes uh, more uniform. Now uh, with this, uh, process, uh, we are printing uh, nano composite uh, contact lenses, we are printing this uh, tinted contact lenses as well. Uh, so this is a resin, 
that we have uh, mixed with our uh, dies like auto 565 uh, and this is auto 488 and uh, there is a there is an issue over here that I will I will highlight a bit later but you know uh, these are our raisins which are previously transparent but you can mix different concentrations of our dyes and uh, we can now 3D print contact lenses which are transparent which are either tinted we we can control the tinting by controlling the concentration very easily we can repeat the uh, process very quickly uh, the this is transparent and compared to that the filtering of uh, different uh, concentrations is shown uh, one issue that we face sometimes is when we mix the uh, when we mix the dyes with the with the raisins uh, the 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 peaks uh, of the absorption move so now this is uh, we are not uh, material science experts but i think the the dyes changes its properties the moment it uh, st starts to interact with the with the other uh, constituents of the raisins, 3D printed raisins. So the, the dip of this dye should have been at 4888 uh, over here, sort of, but it's, it has moved over here uh, beyond 500 nanometers. Uh, so the, the, this is a challenge now that, you know, that after 3D printing and even before 3D printing during the fabrication of the raisin, that the dyes actually, they change their optical uh, properties. And, and sometimes for some materials after uh, 3D printing, the optical properties also move. So after the UV exposure, uh, the optical properties of uh, we sometimes uh, observe that optical properties of uh, the dyes or the overall resin uh, have uh, changed and, uh, as well. Okay, so uh, th that'll be it uh, from my side. Uh, I will highlight uh, the uh, collaborators, uh, the active collaborators at the moment. Uh, uh, Dr. Ali, who is a close collaborator of Dr. Newman and mine another class fellow of ours from Cambridge and uh, our uh, PhD advisor uh, from Cambridge and uh, an, 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 a number of uh, chemists and biomedical engineers that uh, we interact with to optimize our uh, resins and uh, hydrogens uh, and uh, two clinicians uh, who are working in the field of uh, uh, ocular, uh, ocular diseases uh, and uh, uh, Professor James actually runs an uh, eye clinic as well in Birmingham. So, uh, very useful collaboration. So, thank you so much uh, for the invite once again. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Haider was a very interesting talk. I am very surprised how how is uh, going the progress. Uh, many interesting things uh, going on. We have thank some, you. well, there was some uh, there are some questions here. So let me go very quick because we don't have uh, much time now. So let me just pick some because otherwise we will not finish. So for instance, it says, uh, okay, what is the maximum spatial frequency that you can record in the, in the holographic uh, media? Uh, for the holographic media. Yeah, I think he's, he's referring to the resolution. Let's put it that way. The resolution. So the uh, the best resolution uh, theoretically, it has to be, it, it can be lambda divided by two, uh, but that's theoretical. We are always uh, but uh, physically that we did was uh, with uh, infrared, that is uh, one zero six four. With that, we were able to achieve uh, something around uh, seven hundred. Okay, okay. Uh, I think I think that's 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 what uh, they are asking for. So uh, next one: Have you started uh, clinical trials uh, of your devices? Have you observed uh, improvements? Yes. So 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 the ones I highlighted for uh, the picture, uh, f the clinical that we have done uh, so far is like uh, uh, because our uh, device is not variable. It has not gone through animal testing. So the trials that we did uh, for around 20 patients now, we have done a, f a number of patients in UAE now as well. So we only asked the patients to look through the lenses and we have reported this recently in a paper uh, that came out this year actually. So uh, uh, we have a improvement uh, for uh, a good number of patients. 
means they did the test they told us all the numbers without the lens and then with the lens and there was a, a, a good good number of improvement yes okay so there is a question here i don't understand very well it says besides being biocompatible materials how do you about uh, avoid biological contamination um, I, I don't understand that one. I don't know if you understood, but we can. You don't that's understand. A, we can. Yeah, that's a. Yeah, that's a yes, good question. Thanks. Actually, you know, uh, actually, when once we look, this this was a very uh, easy case for us uh, because you know we were using a commercial contact lens and then we were just dipping it in a very safe dye. That's how we produced this lens, so it was safe. Uh, so the results were very good. It means uh, this was control sample. This was our dye, safe, non-toxic. Now what happened over here was uh, in the 3D printed sample, uh, we were again like we were just 3D printing this, uh, and we were using a very safe resin from our site. Uh, and then when we did the toxicity testing on these samples, these samples were like killing all the cells. So we were like very surprised that how can these uh, uh, lenses be toxic? Now, uh, and we thought that the lab had some issues over there, but you know, is then eventually we did a sort of uh, like find out that during the process, like all the all of these uh, like uh, stages, uh, the the samples were getting contaminated by some acid. So, and uh, th that acid was not on the surface; that was in the gel itself uh, during the process uh, curing process coming from the beakers or containers. So yes, I mean, that this is a very, very good point. Uh, during the fabrication, uh, the, uh, the the containers, the beakers, everything that you're preparing these uh, liquids in, everything should be clean. Uh, like uh, as something, things like, uh, which are regularly used like acetone and so. So uh, a little bit of acetone as well were actually responsible for very negative results. Okay, there are two interesting questions here. Um, how to make sure that the printed nanostructure doesn't detach from the contact lens, lens especially when blanking? And a second question is if these nanostructure, nanostructures may induce optical aberrations to the lens that could affect a clear vision. I think it refers to the this surface problem you were talking about. Uh, yes. yes, so uh, when the the contact lenses uh, on which we put our nanostructures, uh, the ones with uh, lasers, so we uh, we actually characterize the surface very thoroughly, and the nanostructure was actually engraved into the surface. Means because the surface uh, was uh, made absorbing with a dark material, after the ablation process. The ablation had left uh, these trenches in the hydrogel surface. So the nanostructure was not uh, coming from the uh, dye itself. After that, the dye was removed. So this nanostructure was basically trenches in the uh, contact lens surface itself. So there is no way to remove it. Oh, very interesting, very interesting. This is a good question here. So I had this question. So you, you, you say that actually you have used as well gold nanoparticles to to make it unexpensive but, they, but the a person said here actually it's not it's not also expensive to use gold nanoparticles what do you think about that yes gold nanoparticle is uh, uh, is, is expensive as well that's true as well i think uh, <laughs> yeah gold it has expensive <laughs> yes okay. uh, that's true that's true uh with regards with regards to nano toxicology, what is the impact on the body of the use of this type of technology? I think you have discussed about that. I don't know if you would if you think that there is more to say. I think I, I, I don't know if there's something more to say, but I think you have been discussing about the Oh okay, I think it refers here more like the nanotoxicology. So it's more like about nanoparticles. Uh but I, I don't know. Yes. Uh, 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 actually, we so we have not uh, in, our devices have not interacted with the body uh, as yet because you know they are not uh, approved clinically. Uh, but you know uh, the the ones with nanoparticles, uh, for example, uh, these nanoparticles have been reported to be antibacterial as well at the same time. Like uh, there are like other uh, 
uh, groups which are making nano composite contact lenses for uh, antibacterial properties as well. Uh, and uh, if the nanoparticles are not on the surface but uh, they are trapped inside the gel media, then there is very less chance of them leaking out. So, so the tox uh, th that uh, toxicity issue would be very minimal, I think. Okay, uh, hi there. just the last comment here. Um, okay, it's, it's a comment with question. It says, uh, I, I suffer of CVD, so your research will be actually very helpful for some... Uh, uh, yes, for, uh, for me. So is there any research going on the uh, on to find a better way to remove CL, CL uh, from the eye? CL, uh, I don't know what is CL uh, refers. Uh, 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 contact, mm, mm, contact, contact, I, I, I don't, I, I don't understand. Okay, is there any research going on to find a better way to remove contact lens from the eye? Mm, I don't know what this is referring to, but. Um, um do, do you, did you understand this uh Heider? uh okay the, he calls uh, them oh, okay i think i think he he talks about uh the the physical process of of actually removing the contact i from the, the I, I don't have experience because i don't use contact lenses but maybe there is yes, some yes. issue about taking them out uh Yes, I think uh, it's a manual process. I, I think there are some uh, vacuum pumps available now, small handheld vacuum pumps, which you can, uh, you know, you can press on, and then it, uh, into, when you release it, it uh, uh, sucks the contact lens. Uh, oh, just like, you know, in uh, in our labs, where, where, where we handle uh, delicate optics, we use these uh, pumps to oh, remotely handle I, lenses. I, I was not aware. Mm, interesting. So, okay, uh, so without further, um, I think I have to say a goodbye. I, uh, the, the institution uh, is providing a, um, how to say, a recognition for uh, for your attendance. It, uh, this was a, an amazing talk, uh, Haider. I, I, I hope uh, this, uh, all these projects uh, come to a, a product at some point and 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 i would i would be very happy to see all your your research uh, getting uh, all the attention that they usually get so uh, have a good day uh, Heide, and have a good day all the rest of people and i will send you your recognition so see you next thank you so much, friday thank you for the invite bye bye bye